Hi, I'm Bernard Leung and you may know me as the executive who works with authorities to fly drone beyond the visual line of sight. And in my spare time, I want to understand why the China tech company ZTE is caught in a US-China trade war. You're listening to Analyze Asia, the weekly podcast dedicated to business technology and media in Asia. And today I have Rayma, founder of Transformative Technology Academy and host of the Tech Bus China podcast. And she was on our show episode 18, which is a very lucky number in Chinese, of our show years back. Welcome, Rayma, and it's great to have you back here again. Hey, Bernard. Thanks for having me back. So since our last conversation, and I think at that point in time, you were with 500 startups, what have you been up to now? Yeah, so since last time we spoke, about a year and a half ago, I left 500 startups and I've been just working on various projects on my own. So actually, I'm at Harvard right now, finishing up an interdisciplinary degree focused on psychology. I'm studying the neuroscience of dopamine, which is especially relevant today because people accuse of it as being the you know chemical behind digital addiction. And that's why I started the Transformative Tech Academy. So it's an online program for entrepreneurs, not too different from the work I was doing at 500 Startups. So still focused on startups, technology, but now I have a sector focus. I'm focused on mental health, emotional well-being, and uh, what we call human flourishing. So are you planning to work on something that will lead to a startup in this category at some point? Yeah, I mean, right now I'm supporting other entrepreneurs, but eventually I do hope to run my own venture lab as well and do my own startup in this space, or hopefully multiple startups. We'll see. It is a very interesting area because there has been a lot of conversation about tech addiction. And I think one of the most conscious effort that my wife and I did to our kids is we actually ban all the devices off our living room. So one of the things that I'm actually quite happy about is that my daughter doesn't look at any iPad or iPhone in a Chinese restaurant where everybody is just glued to it like a digital pacifier. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really good. I think that's also the trend now in Silicon Valley. Actually, people call it like what smartphones are the new smoking. <laughs> so you definitely see that more and more in Silicon Valley. Parents are trying to adopt that as well. But it sounds like you've been successful. No, I'm still learning. But I want to hear more about your Tech Bus China podcast. And I've been listening to it is by Pan Daily, right? How did that project came about? Yeah, so well, we work with Pan Daily. They're a producer. And so I moved away from China at the end of 2015. Yeah, so I guess it's over two years now. But while I don't live there currently, I still run a bunch of projects there, including a fund-related one that's still in stealth. So hopefully I get to talk about that next time I'm on this podcast. But basically what I found was that there's still a gap between what the industry insiders in China think about China tech and what makes it actually into mainstream media here in the U.S., so while that gap has really, you know, become a lot smaller in the past couple of years because of great coverage from, you know, people like you and other journalists, et cetera, I still feel like there's an opportunity to do in-depth, like deep dives on uh, some of the Chinese companies and industries that I've gotten to know really well. So I got my friend Ying Ying Lu and together and we just launched this podcast basically in beginning of May, I think. So we go beyond the facts and try to give you an understanding of why this topic or this headline is relevant. Possibly the same reason why I got you on the show, because I really enjoyed that episode about what you all discuss about ZTE, which is a very interesting company. And that's why oh. I've got you on the show. So Yay. I, yeah, to start, I want to first introduce the company, ZTE Corporation or Zhongxing is a Chinese multinational telecommunications equipment and systems company headquartered in Shenzhen, Guangdong, running at about 108 billion yuan renminbi, which is equivalent about US 16 billion revenue in 2017 with about 74.7k customers, which is enterprise mainly. I'm very curious to know, I think probably it's much better to hear from you. Can you briefly introduce the Chinese company ZTE and what they do? Yeah, sure. So it's a telecom equipment and systems company. If your listeners have heard of Huawei, they're kind of similar. So as you said, it's based in Shenzhen, and it was founded in 1985 as Shenzhen Semiconductor Company. In the 19, early 1990s, I guess, it became a, what's called a state-owned private enterprise. And I think the idea is that the assets are state-owned. So ZTE, in part, is still owned by the state. But the daily operations and everything else is actually by market mechanisms, right? So privately held. And... 
it was listed, I think, in 1997 on both the Hong Kong and Shenzhen stock ex- exchanges. So you can buy the stock if you would like. I think one interesting thing is that since this company is set up pretty much very early in the 1990s, what's the history behind this company, and who are the kind of key people behind this company as well? So ZTE was. Well, like like I was saying earlier, right? It started off as this Shenzhen Semiconductor Co. And now, actually, ZTE now has a shareholder called Zhongxingxin. I don't know what is the exact Chinese word. I just went through to their filing, but it owns about thirty percent of ZTE, and that's a state-owned enterprise. The rest of it is owned by private enterprises and individuals. But ZTE was. Created right, like I said, to be the state-owned private enterprise, and so Zhongxinxin actually, the thirty percent shareholder, is jointly formed by three separate other state-owned shareholders. Right, these are state-owned enterprises. One of them is Xi'an Microelectronics, one of them is Aerospace Guangyu, and the third one is Zhongxin WXT. But in two thousand seventeen, actually, they had another fourth state-owned shareholder called Guoxing. Reiko, I'm not sure the exact Chinese words, but basically that 30% stake is now made up of four state-owned shareholders. It is divided into three business units. I actually went to their website, so they are focused on carrier networks, terminals, and telecommunications. So, what are these business units, and who are actually their customers? Well, actually, it's interesting you ask that because I also went through their filings and I looked at, at yes. So that is true. That those are their business segments. You know, the names I think are self-explanatory, right? The carrier networks, terminals, telecommunications. I think a better way to look at their business is if you look at the way they talk about it on their income statement, which is by uh, business segment. So here they use three different segments, which is carrier networks, but then government and corporate business and consumer business. Consumer business is sort of basically their smartphone business. You can think of that, right? And then the carrier networks. Which is sort of your telecom equipment business, etc. So by this measure, carrier networks are about sixty percent. Consumer business is about a third, so thirty-two percent, and government and corporate businesses the nine, remaining nine percent. So actually, if you look at it, they have a pretty significant consumer business. A third is quite a lot. Their consumer business is both, you know, domestic and People's Republic of China, as well as abroad. And in the U.S., actually, you can find over a dozen carriers who sell their smartphones. So carriers, mainstream carriers such as AT and T, and T-Mobile, and, and Verizon, as well as smaller ones such as Metro PCS or Boost Mobile. For American listeners, they might know who those are. Similar to Huawei, they sell carrier networks to other governments or other telecommunications companies across maybe probably Euro, Middle East, or Africa. Yes, yes, that exactly, and that's why they got into trouble with the U.S. government.、Mm, so here's the fun part of the conversation. So how did they got into trouble with the U.S. authorities then? Yeah, so basically the U.S. government. Has these sanctions against certain countries, and in recent years, Iran and North Korea have been two of those countries. For ZTE, in 2016, investigations revealed that it had been selling product basically to Iran and North Korea, and the. Reason why that's wrong is because the sanctions forbid any U.S. products from being sold there, and ZTE sources a lot of components from the U.S. So in a way, they were selling U.S. goods there, right? Because of the components. So in 2017, they reached an agreement with the U.S. government, acknowledging that yes, they had violated these sanctions. They were fined about a billion dollars. What happened this year was that. Instead of doing what they said they would do and complying with the punishment that they were given last year, they actually did a lot of things the opposite way. So the staff that was involved and revealed in the investigation to be committing these acts. Were not reprimanded. They were actually giving full bonuses. I mean, I read in Chinese media that they ha- actually had an internal handbook on how to get around these rules and fool the U.S. government. And if you look on bis.doc.gov, which is you know I think Bureau of Industry and 
security or something for the U.S. government, you can actually see a PowerPoint the government created about how ZTE was going around these sanctions. And that basically included them setting up a third-party firm and funneling orders through there, basically. So this is potentially how they got into trouble. But I think one interesting question is that there's also a reason that why when President Xi Jinping from China call up Donald Trump and say, hey, you know, please go easy on ZTE. I think part of the reason is actually because of the US suppliers to ZTE. So how important are they to ZTE? And why is it that Donald Trump actually intervened on the ZTE ban in such a friendly way? Well, there's various theories on that. So you have just mentioned one of the theories, which is that actually because ZTE is so dependent on US components, so Qualcomm, I read conflicting reports basically online that says, There are some analysts that say they support 25%. There are some analysts that say they support two-thirds of ZTEs like smartphones, right? I I don't know what what is the correct number, but it's apparently a lot. And either way, ZTE sources other chips from other U.S. manufacturers and or you other US semiconductor companies. And basically they're highly reliant not just on the chip manufacturers, but for example, their software is Android. So again, you know, the ban would have also affected them procuring the Android OS as part of the software for their products. So because it would have banned all US products. And yes, you could see that in the case of one of their core suppliers, I think it makes uh, some components called I don't know how to say the name, Akaya, A-C-A-I-A. You can see that after the ban came out, their stock actually dropped. In that way, maybe you can say Trump was protecting U.S. businesses because, you know, ZTE is a customer of U.S. businesses. But there are conspiracy theorists who say that it also came awfully close upon the heels of a certain loan. It was like a half a billion dollar loan that was being given by a Chinese state enterprise to, uh, not ZTE related, but another one entirely to uh, some properties in Indonesia that Trump was going to personally benefit from. So that was also a story that was in mainstream media. And, you know, to be honest, I don't know uh, what is the real reason why he's, you know, quote unquote friendly. Maybe it's, you know, combination of things, but it is true that he was relatively easygoing because he went ahead and, you know, at least made the immediate penalties of the sanctions go away. Although he did intervene on the ZTE ban in a friendly way, but the Senate in the US didn't. So I think now there's a lot of back and forth going between the White House and the Senate in the United States. But I think on a broader level, what I'm really curious is that what are the consequences if the ban were to continue without Trump's intervention? And where Where is ZTE in its current status at the moment? So as you said, ZTE has, at least for the next month, it's sort of free to operate because the immediate sanctions have, or the immediate ban has been lifted. But at the end of this month, which is July, the Senate supposed to go back and make sure that it's complying. And then maybe it may decide, it may reimpose bans, right? If ZTE is not complying. Currently, the stock is down about 60% from before the ban occurred. So it's at 31 uh, 31 RMB and now it's at 13 RMB. Its market cap is barely $8 billion. The few days it opened after suspended trading for a bunch of weeks, it actually dropped by 10% on the China market. And you ask why 10%? Well, that's the max. It gets to drop before trading is suspended for the day. So it is really taken a beating. Before Trump temporarily reversed this ban, there was definitely many concerns that it was going to go bankrupt and that its 80,000 or 90,000 employees might all be out of a job. And that was actually one of the reasons why Trump said, you know, quote unquote, he's helping ZTE because all these employees involved, et cetera. So we'll see. Right now, as you're saying, it's kind of temporarily alive. A lot of analysts think that even if the ban is permanently reversed, DTE is going to have a large hole to climb out of. And currently, as part of the conditions right, for reversing the ban, it's got to change its entire board and all its senior management above a certain level. And it's already replaced the president and a bunch of other senior managers. Given that I think we are just three days after the US-China trade war started, 
and the terrorists are really beginning to impose. How does this ZTE debacle actually fit into the US-China trade war then? Yeah, so I think that this is not, I mean, there's some headlines that sensationalize it and say, you know, this like is one of the first battles of the trade war. But actually, I mean, if you look at the history of the case, it's, they've been under investigations for a long time, right? They were fined heavily last year. So it's really been going on for a while, well before the Trump administration. But I do think that it's one of the more important battles because especially if you look at just China tech, there's been a lot of rhetoric in China about how China is really advanced in technology these days since the beginning of this decade. And she's taking a lot of credit for that and is also really heavily behind pushing for technology advancements. So for CTE, this is a huge wake-up call to the Chinese people to be like, hey, even though we thought we were really advanced, actually, a lot of the core IP of these products that our big companies such as ETE are making is actually still coming from the US. So the brains inside our you know, electronics is still foreign made. And that's been a huge wake-up call for China to really realize that the trade war might take on a different dimension if you include not just like, you know, the common goods that we talk about, like whatever, steel, soybeans, all this stuff. But what if it involves real deep tech? Then China maybe has like a long way to go, actually. There's some people, I think I mentioned in our podcast that believe it's a 30-year lag, which is very significant. I thought the irony is that other than soybeans, aluminum, steel, you know, that all the U.S. campaign flags and even the U.S. flags are actually all being in China by one supplier. So it's going to become a very, very interesting situation that probably the U.S. politicians are going to be paying more in order to have their flags be made. To take this a little bit further, what are the long-term consequences from China's perspective? I mean, we know that China has the made in 2025 a plan in their five-year plan. So where does this go for China? I think China is really the ZTE debacle, fiasco, scandal, whatever you want to call it. Like I was saying earlier, has really woken up the Chinese people and Chinese governments there is a lot of coverage on how China must beef up its semiconductor industry, right? So, you know, have recently announced, although I don't think this is after ZT, I think this might be before a $30 billion fund to focus on semiconductors. And recently, I actually advise an AI chip company. So I look at this space quite a bit. Recently, you can see a lot of Chinese chip companies actually get significant amounts of funding. In addition to, by the way, manufacturing subsidies, like a company called Cavercon, AI chip company recently raised $500 million. And it was led by the state's SDIC. It was one of the state's venture funds. So China is also building fabs like crazy there's something like 22 fabs right now under construction in China. So I think in the short and long run, China is looking to wean itself from you know, U.S. dominance in this particular area of technology. And it's just doing that at a much more aggressive pace since the ZTE situation. I was in Silicon Valley in 2016 and I recently visited China in one, two months ago where I actually visited some AI chip companies because of my day job. And I thought, well, some of them are actually far more advanced than what I have seen in Silicon Valley, particularly a company called Horizon Robotics, which was set up by the two founders were the person who created uh, Baidu's AI lab before Andrew Ng came on board, basically. They are actually putting their chips into Google's self-driving car. And the way they are doing obstacle identification is way out of the, the this world. I mean, against all the other technology that's within the same space. I think in this longer run, I would actually see China will become very dominant with chip hardware and software integration for autonomous vehicles. I'm not talking about cars, I'm talking about drones as well in the space, given that they are really dominant in consumer drones. Do you see that being the case as well? Yeah, I mean, I don't know the space nearly as well as you do, because you see the finished product as well. And right now, just, you know, work with really early stage startups in the space. But I think there's a chance, right? I wouldn't say the battle is like, you know, it's going to be clear who's winning. But I think 
just given the current interest when you talk to Chinese investors about like AI chips, about you know anything related to do semiconductors, uh, and when you talk to especially Chinese born entrepreneurs. The amount of money subsidies, government funding they're able to get in China versus Silicon Valley, the difference is staggering. It's probably like a 10x difference, maybe more for you know like celebrity entrepreneurs such as the people at Horizon that that you just mentioned. So I think China could have a chance. Again, though, I think with AI, it's hard to know where the customers will finally be, right? And with the U.S. government. Maybe they'll start putting in some restrictions on Chinese investment and working with U.S. customers. I don't, I don't exactly know how they'll do that, but there is some anxiety, at least in Silicon Valley, that that could happen. A couple articles recently have been focused on that. So, but if if nothing, yeah, I mean, I guess that's what I have to say on this subject. Well, since you are here, I have to ask you this: Do you think what Mike Moritz said about China is coming for the U- U.S. startups in Silicon Valley is true? I mean, he's been trolling Silicon Valley with the nine nine six, and then about how great China tech is. Do you think he's trying to sound the alarm bell for them? Because you know, people in Silicon Valley can be quite insulated from things that's outside that's happening all over the world. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny that you say he's trolling Silicon Valley. Well, first of all, I really disagreed with his nine nine six article. I thought it was horrible. There's actually so many articles in Chinese language complaining about that, even in tech media, about how that's a horrible thing and it doesn't actually increase, you know, productivity necessarily. Just causes burnout. But I do think that. Yes, it's probably true that Silicon Valley entrepreneurs are a little less aware of China than the other way around. But at the same time, I see that increasing so much more because of this exact ph- phenomenon that we talked about, where Chinese entrepreneurs are getting large amounts of funding or making significant product progress in areas that are previously maybe dominated by Silicon Valley, right? So we'll see. But in this in the specific case of semiconductors, I do have to say it's still too early to say. In self driving and other things, you actually you are starting to see companies. By the way, for example, like Neuro, that their Series A, which was quite large, ninety two million dollars, was actually co led by a U.S. top tier VC firm and a Chinese top tier VC firm. So Greylock and Banyan Capital. And I don't know, maybe in the future, companies aren't necessarily so clear cut US versus China. Maybe they're sort of a global hybrid. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree with you on that. And actually, this is really strange because the US and China tax scene is pretty interlinked together. There's a lot of Chinese money investing into Silicon Valley and vice versa. So, I mean, with this ongoing trade war, wouldn't it be really counterproductive because we're starting to see a lot of synergies and a lot of new innovations that's coming up from both China and the US? Yeah, I mean, if you ask me, yes, I think it's counterproductive, but I'm not, you know, I don't represent everyone's interests and, you know, I'm not a politician. And actually what you say about, you know, Chinese money investing in Silicon Valley, it's interesting because I actually think it's probably far less in reality than the US, the amount of US money that's invested in China. Because if you look at, I mean, I don't know the LP breakdowns of the leading US dollar funds investing in Chinese companies, which still, by the way, are the dominant, right, source of capital. They're US, like they're US LPs for the most part, I think. So if you look at, you know, Sequoia Matrix, whatever, or even the latest flavor of, you know, hedge fund hybrids, Co2, et cetera, investing in China. These are all USD from USLPs. So I actually think US has significant exposure in Chinese tech and will want to do, will want Chinese tech to do well and would want that flow of capital to be available or that uh, channel of capital flow to be available. I just have one question. I guess what are the lessons that Chinese companies will learn from this crisis? I think this will probably be very important in the evolution of Chinese tech companies going global and thinking about their ambitions coming out of China. Well, the first thing is that the U.S. government is really serious. So definitely <laughs> comply with everything that they ask you to do or else, you know, the consequences are disastrous, right? So it's 
it's funny because if you actually read the Chinese language, you know, not the media coverage, but what people say on the comments and message boards, Chinese people are primarily, they're actually not surprised that ZTE went ahead and flouted these sanctions and restrictions. They're actually angry at ZTE for being so stupid because ZTE just did some very, very like unsophisticated ways of trying to cheat the U.S. government. (laughs) So I thought that was actually really funny. But I think hopefully what China learns is that, number one, don't flout the regulations. Number two, really invest in R&D, right? Really like don't be dependent on other people for sort of the core of your product. Move up the supply chain, right? Own as much of the IP as possible. Don't just be assembling and manufacturing. Sure, you have this amazing domestic market with a lot of pent-up demand and whatever, but you run out of that at one point and it's much better to own the core technology. I think that's the main lesson that Chinese companies are learning and have been trying to do. They just can't hurry it as much in semiconductors as they can in, say, internet. I thought the irony is that Huawei actually followed the rules and got their phone approved and then got the deal with AT&T done and they still got banned. <laughs> oh, I didn't even read that. But I know that Huawei, I mean, honestly, like Huawei, I've, I've had a little bit of dealings with Huawei in the past, you know, just visiting some management, etc. And I always thought they're a pretty serious company, like definitely play by the book, very, very serious, very austere if you visit their offices. But, you know, just because they're Chinese, I I feel bad for them. They're not going to escape the wrath of the U.S. government. Yeah. And I think this is something that we'll be continuing to watch. And I definitely would want you to be back here and have another conversation, probably on something much more interesting than maybe (laughs) what you're doing as well. Rima, it's great to have you here. In closing, i like to ask my guests two questions now. So the first question is, can you recommend a book, movie, podcast, or anything else that impacted your personal or work life? Recently, I would say I'd like to recommend two books. I, I don't really watch too much TV. So TV-wise, I, I recommend Westworld. I really like that show. <laughs> but yeah. I like it too. Great. Two books I read recently that I really like. One is by Alain de Botton. I think that's how you pronounce his name. It's called The Constellations of Philosophy. So it's not a tech-related book at all. It's just more about how famous philosophers in the past, six of them to be exact, really thought through the deeper questions of life. I found it to be really funny and both and enlightening as well. Another book called A Short History of Nearly Everything by Bill Bryson. Highly recommend that book. I think I've been telling all my friends to read it. It really shows you that humans live in a very sort of precarious state in nature and that all the stuff that we take for granted is actually sort of by chance. And we've really co-evolved with the environment to get here, but it could be sort of take, snatched away at any given moment. So reading it will probably make you appreciate the efforts of Elon Musk even more <laughs> because we are very, very unimportant and fragile in the grand scheme of things. And then furthermore, I think the book really teaches about how a lot of what people think they know about the world at any given moment, you know, even quote unquote through science, is most often wrong because he goes through all the important discoveries in the past and how oftentimes the right thing or, you know, the the truth was actually at first thought wrong. So I think it's healthy to take that much of what we know and take for granted. It's probably incorrect or at least uh, incomplete. And just... You have recommended The Constellations of Philosophy. There is a book I would highly recommend from the same author called Status Anxiety. And I think for entrepreneurs and for people who are thinking about what they want to achieve in life and they get pressure, they get a lot of this status anxiety, this is a good book to actually appreciate what you have. And I think you probably could put a lot of things in perspective as well on that. So my last question then, where can my audience find you? Uh, probably easiest to find me on Twitter. So I'm just at Rayma. That's spelled R-U-I-M-A. And your LinkedIn and your podcast, I can find you too, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, sure, sure. Our podcast uh, is Tech Buzz China. So on Twitter as well, just T-E-C-H-B-U-Z-Z China. And you can find me at Bernard Leung. And at BernardLeung.com, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Acast. And of course, Google Play as well in the US market. And tweet to me, Drop me feedback and give us 
five star on Apple Podcasts or a star on Overcast and Pocket Cast. And of course, I would love to hear from your feedback. So Rima, really great to talk to you. Let's stay in touch and I hope to speak to you again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me.